A very good afternoon and a warm welcome to everyone joining our masterclass series on emerging technologies. Today's topic is neural networks and artificial intelligence. Organized under the Ages of India Israel Forum, I'm jointly convened by the Ananta Aspen Center, Confederation of Indian Industry, and Tel Aviv University. This series is an initiative to promote academic linkages between India and Israel by enhancing technical knowledge and awareness about emerging technologies among college students in India. These masterclasses are possible thanks to the generous support of Triveni Turbine Limited. This is the second class of the third edition of the series. Two more masterclasses are planned in this academic year, and we look forward to your participation in those classes as well. We are delighted to have Professor Jonathan Berendt, Associate Professor at the School of Computer Science at Delvavi University, join us for this interesting session. He's also a research scientist at the Allen Institute for AI. Professor Berendt has received several awards and fellowships during his career. A very warm welcome to you, Professor. We are happy to have you with us today for this masterclass. We will begin with a 45-minute presentation by Professor and then open up the Q&A round. I would request all of you to please send in your questions throughout the session and do not wait until the end. We will be taking up your questions during the second half of the session. If you're watching the session on Zoom, please use the Q&A portal at the bottom of your screen. And if you are on Facebook, please write your questions in the government section. It is my pleasure to now invite Professor Bieran to begin the class. Okay. Thank you, Kanika, for this warm welcome. Um, I'll share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, Professor. OK, great. So let's start. So I will talk today in the topic of neural networks in artificial intelligence uh, about uh, recent revolutions in natural language processing. So I'm an associate professor here at Tel University, and my main field of research is natural language processing. Uh, so I'll focus on that and talk about some dramatic changes that, that have happened in our field uh, in the last eight years. So first, again, I know it's a very uh, broad audience. Uh, um, so I want to start by just like uh, pointing out pointing out what is uh, natural language processing. So when we talk about natural language processing, what we typically mean uh, is that this is the field of science and engineering uh, that focuses on building uh, these boxes, these NLP boxes that take as input uh, some text uh, that is already typically uh, transcribed. It's not speech, it's not like audio wave, but it's actually like characters, letters, words, and so on. Uh, and they are in natural language. They're not Java or Python. Uh, they are English, Hebrew, Hindi, Chinese, uh, something like that. Uh, and then the output is uh, something useful, something that you would like to get out of uh, reading some text. Uh, and we'll go through some examples. So uh, what are useful things that you can do with an NLP box? One thing you can do is machine translation. We're given, uh, I don't speak Hindi, but I copied this from the internet. Uh, that given some sentence in English, you can uh, translate it to, to another language. This is one thing that an NLP box can do for you. Uh, another thing, it, it might, it might uh, answer your question. Maybe someone is asking, uh, on what day does my talk? Um, so you might have an NLP box that understands this question that is uh, expressed through natural language in English in this case, and it interacts with your calendar application on your mobile phone to give you the date. So here's another example. Uh, and the field of NLP has been really going through a boom uh, because the technology has become more mature and there are many, many potential applications for natural language processing. Let's quickly go over some of these applications. One is what's called text classification, where given some piece of text, it can be a sentence, it can be a paragraph or a Wikipedia page or a book or a document. Uh, you get as input this text and you output what is the topic, you classify this. So uh, the topic, and this is from a, like a predefined list of topics. So for example, it might be uh, the topic like sports, politics, or science, or it might be, you know, given a movie review, whether the movie, whether the review is supportive or against the movie and so on. So you can imagine many cases where you get some text, you want to output some 
some number like between one and 20 that corresponds to the topic or the sentiment or anything that you predefine. Another very uh, interesting application to NLP is what's called information extraction. Uh, people write a lot of text on the web all the time and it's unstructured and it's hard to process and it's hard to kind of like get to, it's hard to search for in many cases. So one thing that people want is to structure it. So take unstructured text and structure it. What I mean by structure, you can imagine like building like these giant tables that describe what is in the text. For example, I might be interested in identifying people, where they worked and when they worked. So given the piece of text that we see here, I would like to automatically constrain can uh, uh, construct a table or a database that later I will be able to analyze, query, and so on. So this is information extraction. Question answering, you all know that as time goes by, uh, companies like Google have better and better question answering uh, abilities. So you can, instead of typing keywords into your search engine, your favorite search engine, you can just type answer, uh, questions in natural language and many languages. And in many cases, instead of getting the blue links, you will get directly the answer. And another application that is very important is virtual assistants, where you would like to actually have your computer do something for you. For example, move all my Wednesday meetings in April with John to 5 p.m. Again, here you need to understand what exactly is the meaning, who is John, what date exactly, what meetings are referred to, and perform an action. So these are is another application. Another one is machine translation. This is from Hebrew uh, to English. Uh, and this is like from a few months ago, and it's quite good. Uh, so definitely there's a huge market for translating languages from one to the other. Summarization, there's more and more applications where people don't have time. They are too lazy to read very long documents. They would like something to summarize the main points in the document. So another application is taking a long text and outputting a short text that kind of like extracts the main points from that text. So there are many, many, many applications to natural language processing, and this is becoming a very large industry in recent years. So that's a little bit about what is natural language processing and what are the applications of natural language processing. So the, the second thing I want to uh, kind of like quickly talk about is why is natural language processing even hard? Uh, I mean, you might think, you know, language has some symbols, it's composed of words or I don't know what, uh, and maybe you just like write a program. If you have some background in computer science, you write a program and you say, I don't know, if this word is next to another word, then the meaning is something kind of like, just kind of like enumerate. You can enumerate all possible phrases or something and what do they mean and how do they compose and then you're done. So why is that like not the case and why this problem of understanding natural language uh, is a scientific field that people have been interested in? In, in many years, in uh, 50 years or something. So there are various properties of natural language that kind of like make it sometimes difficult uh, for processing by computers. Computers, you know, when they process language, they get just a bunch of characters, a string of characters. They have no idea what these characters mean. And for them to understand language, they need to be able to do a lot of things. One thing that they need to do is handle the fact that language is ambiguous. What does it mean that language is ambiguous? The same sentence or the same natural language utterance can mean very different things in different cases. And this can depend on the context, like who are you talking to, and can depend on many, many things. One genre that is uh, beloved is the genre of uh, headlines of newspapers where people try to write uh, very succinctly. And then many times you get ambiguity. So for example, there, th these are real titles from real newspapers across the world. And there are websites that kind of like collect those. And uh, you can get things like enraged cow injures farmer with ax. And it's unclear if you're a computer, there's just no way, uh, unless you have a lot of background knowledge to understand if it is the cow that is carrying the ax or the farmer that is carrying the ax. And this is something that is important for understanding of this sentence. Or for example, hospitals are sued by seven foot doctors. Again, there is ambiguity here, uh, whether the doctors are high, they are seven, seven foot tall, or they are foot doctors, doctors for feet, uh, and there are seven of them. And these ambiguities are uh, mostly, de mostly depend on 
the relations between words, how you analyze the relations between words, whether, you know, um, uh, um, seven foot is like a phrase that modifies doctors or foot modifies doctors and seven modifies foot doctors. And again, if you're a computer, it's quite hard for you to disambiguate the, these. These are quite likely. And the reason that you know that for the second it's, it's like seven foot doctors is because you know, well, you know, doctors work in hospitals and doctors typically uh, specialize on some organ. So it makes more sense that they are foot doctors than that they are tall. So this is problem number one in NLP, the fact that it's ambiguous. The second problem in processing natural language is variability. And that is the fact that it's the opposite of ambiguity. It's not only that the same sentence can mean many things, it's that the same meaning can be expressed in many, many ways. So for example, here are many, many ways to say roughly the same thing. And again, if you're constructing models of, uh, that need to process language, understand the meaning of language, well, they need to be robust to that. Uh, 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 a program needs to be able to perform what it should do regardless of the way the natural language is expressed. So we expect uh, our natural language processing models to handle language regardless of how it is expressed, to transform from the form, uh, which can be very variable, to the meaning uh, of, the, of these forms. So this is the second problem when doing natural language processing. And again, it's quite uh, challenging if you're a computer that doesn't know a lot about the world. Uh, another problem with processing natural language processing is that it's sparse. And that means that the space of possible sentences in language is huge and it grows what's called exponentially. If every language has, I don't know, let's say as a uh, you know, lower bound 10,000 words, then there are 10,000 squared sentences uh, of two words, 10,000 cubed of three words, and this grows exponentially. And so it's quite likely that most of the sentences that you are hearing in your day-to-day -day lives are sentences that you have never heard before. So it's not like you can memorize a lot. It's not like you can say, okay, this sentence I've already heard, I know what it means. Now I'm ready for all the other, uh, other cases where I'm going to hear it because most sentences are long and you have never heard them before. So you need to interpret their meaning on the fly. So you must what's called generalize, generalize to new examples. And this is something that is difficult. And last, again, language is really dependent on context. The same thing can mean different things in different contexts. You know, if I say I'm really tired, I might expect my robot to go fetch me coffee, uh, even though I didn't say that explicitly. So if I'm going to build this robot, it, it needs to know that even though I'm not explicitly saying that I want coffee, if I'm expressing fatigue, well, then that should be done. Okay. So, uh, oh, and the last reason is what's called uh, Alan Turing said so. I don't know, I hope many of you know Alan Turing, a famous mathematician from the UK, uh, who famously, who was like the founder of computer science. And in the early 50s, he wrote this essay on what would it take to have intelligent machines. Um, and there he famously uh, said, uh, um, designed the Turing test where he said, well, I don't know how to test if a machine is intelligent. I don't know how to define intelligence, but if a machine can talk to a human and the human will not be able to tell if it is a human or a machine that is talking to, well, then it is intelligent. So basically he said, okay, intelligence, I don't know how to define it, but I'm going to reduce it to the problem of having fluent conversation with another human being. So he thought, that mastering language is similar to mastering intelligence. So this is another, another sign that NLP is actually a difficult task. Okay, so that was part two. So we you know, discussed what is NLP? What is the goal of NLP? And secondly, we talked about why is it hard? Why can't I sit for like a month and write like a computer program that maybe is 1000 lines long and uh, be done with it, just like be done with the model of that language. So I hope this is, these two points are clear now. And now I want to move on into what, how does NLP actually work, okay? So NLP uh, in the last, let's say, 30 years is dominated by statistical methods and by machine learning methods. Uh, and what is the general paradigm? Well, the general paradigm is the following, um, you know, uh, maybe maybe I'll, I'll say something. So the reason why we, we use machine learning 
for processing language is because it is hard to write down all of the rules of language. So what is, what is the thing that machine learning is really good at? What, is, what, what are the things where machine learning really shines? Well, it shines in the cases where there is something that humans know very well how to do just by their experience in the world, but it's, it is very hard for people to say exactly how they do it. Like when I, when I see a zebra and I know it is a zebra, why do I know that it is a zebra? I don't know to, how to explain why. Maybe it's the stripes, maybe it's the shape. I cannot really write like explicitly what are the reasons why I identified this as a zebra. But I do know that it's a zebra because I've seen a lot of zebras. Um, and machine learning really shines in these cases where it, people can perform something just by their experience, but it's hard for them to explain why this is the case. And language is the same. People speak language even though they cannot write down the rules of language. So that's why we turn to methods for machine learning, because it's this thing that is learned from examples, but is hard to kind of like explain formally. So what is machine learning? Machine learning or supervised learning in this case is this paradigm where you're given examples. So for example, let's say I want to recognize animals. So someone shows me a picture of a dog and says, this is a dog, a picture of a cat. This is a cat, another picture of a dog. This is a dog, another picture of a cat. This is a cat. So this is the training set. Uh, X is like a picture, an image, and Y is the label. What is the animal in that? So that's the training set. And the, 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 the job of a machine learning algorithm is to look at these examples and learn a function, learn the, a function, which is the function F. And this function is a function that will take an image and output a label. Okay, so that's uh, machine learning uh, in a nutshell. You get a tra supervised learning. You get a training set, a bunch of examples for something that you would like to do, like identifying cats and dogs in images. And then you learn a function that will do this prediction. And what should be the properties of the, this function? There are two main properties. The first one, which is like a minimal one, it should at least explain the training set, right? Like we're, we expect that when we apply our function f on each one of the examples in the training set that they showed us in advance, that the output will be y, okay? And this is what's called um, an optimization problem, right? So there will be some model and it's what's called parameterized. It has a bunch of free parameters. It's like, you can imagine it has like a million different knobs and we need to set the knobs in such a way such that it explains the training set, right? That if you, if you give this function that has a million knobs an image from the training set, it will output the correct thing. And this is an optimization problem. How do I set the knobs? There are many ways to set the knobs. How do I find what is the way to set the knobs such that the output will be correct? So this is the optimization part. And then there's the generalization part, which is perhaps more uh, interesting and more interesting that it works is that this function doesn't really need to just explain the, the, the training set. It needs to generalize. If I show this function an image that I have never seen in my life, I would like it to classify it to the correct label Y, right? So if you train a model to translate from French to English, you expect it to work on any French sentence, even those that you have never seen before, because there are so many French uh, sentences. So these are the properties that should be of a, of a, of a machine learning model. And NLP is based on, on such methods. So here are some examples for XY pairs that you might want to construct. The first one we already talked about, you get an image of an object. So you feed the computer an image and image is like an array of pixels, uh, RGB values of some sort. And the output is the identity. It's a chair, it's a dog, it's a person. Uh, here's another example. If you want to teach a machine to play Go or chess or Atari, well, the input should be, let's say a picture of what exactly is going on in the, in the board right now. And the output should be, what will be the next rule? So this is Y. Here's another example. X can be a sentence in English and Y can be a sentence in French. And then it's a machine translation system. X can be the sound wave of some speech and Y can be transcription. And then it's a, a speech to text model, uh, automatic speech recognition. And X can be a question in English and Y can be the relevant web pages. And this is a search engine. Okay, I don't really see anyone. I hope uh, it's clear, but uh, uh, yeah, it will go on. 
So this is, these are examples for you collect training sets of these objects and then you train functions to map from X to Y. Okay, so the question is, what is this function, right? Like, what, what is the shape of this function that maps out from X to Y? And the revolution is in the change of, in, in the form of this function. So if we look at what was going on uh, 10 years ago, uh, then, um, um, yeah, I guess the function F is not the function mapping from X to Y, I'll explain in a second. So let's say you got some X that is a natural language text. For example, the movie was great. Okay, this is what's called a sentiment analysis task. I already kind of like touched upon it. If you get a review for a movie and you want to automatically label whether this review likes the movie or this review does not like the movie, right? So this is a, a very typical and useful scenario for product reviews. You can imagine, you know, uh, uh, Amazon wants to know if people like their products and which products are good and which products are bad. And also consumers want to know that. So you get X, which is some natural language text. This is X and Y should be uh, the label, whether it's positive or negative sentiment. And the way that this worked is that people, um, uh, uh, domain experts, people that were working in natural language processing, they manually defined features F of X. Okay, so they manually defined, they took the text X and they mapped it to a vector. As you know, a vector is like a, an array of floats, like a high dimensional float vector array. Um, so it, it mapped the, 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 the sentence X to, um, to a vector of features. And then the function, the function that mapped the sentence X to the label Y was this function that you see here. I hope you see my uh, cursor. It's the sign of the dot product between the weights of the model W and the features of the models F of X. Okay, so more explicitly, you get X, you extract features F of X. I will say something about what are the features in a second. And then the model is defined by another vector w which basically says for each vector what is uh, like the, the the rule for this particular feature whether it indicates that uh this sentence is positive or negative and then you take a dot product here right what's a dot product is a sum over the multiplication of all of the elements that are in the same dimension i hope you know what dot product is and then you either get a number that is either positive or negative and if the number is positive you output the movie is good and if the number if the if the number is negative then you output the movie is bad right so now we have a machine learning model this is our machine learning model that outputs sine of w times f of x okay and now the question is what are these features so one typical example for example for predicting the sentiment of the movie would be given the movie x the feature will be how many times did a certain word appear in x so the feature vector for the for the a sentence the movie was great is a feature vector that has a value for every word in the language for the word table the value is zero because table doesn't appear in the movie was great for the entry great the the the, the, the feature will be one because the word great appears once and the word movie appears once so the count will also be one okay so here's a very typical what's called a bag of word feature vector where you take the text, you ignore the order of the words, you just count how many times each word appears. And then the goal of the model is to learn the weights W, where the word, the, the weight WI basically says whether this word indicates that the move is good or bad. You can imagine that the weight for the feature great will be high because typically when reviews contain the word great then the sentiment is positive and this will explain the trainings okay so i hope this was clear this this was the typical case in nlp 10 years ago you get some sentence some text you define some feature function and this definition is done by people and then you learn what's called a linear model your model is linear it's just a weighted sum of the features so this is like a not very expressive model because it's only the, the, the family of functions that you can model are linear functions of the features that you extract from the sentence. So this was NLP 10 years ago. And it worked not bad, but it was not very good. 
Uh, and this is like how things typically work. Like if you had to build a machine learning model, well, how would that work? Well, most of the time would be wasted on uh, designing the feature, actually designing the feature vectors. And then the last part is like learning the weights W. And this would be most of the time, and this would be very little time. So this is not very compelling, right? Because you want to do something automatically, but still you're wasting a lot of time describing your data in a way that the model can understand. Here's another way to look at it. Again, the, the models that we had back then were linear. You would describe your model, let's say like this is like two, two you have two features and red is minus one and green is a plus one, then you can only have like linear functions. You would have to find some line that separates as best as possible the points that the, 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 the points that are positive from the points that are negative. So these are the features and there is no line that actually separates them. So linear functions are not expressive enough in many cases. You can see that if you were would be able to separate them with more complex uh, with more complex lines, then thing would work, things would work much better. Okay. So 10 years ago, the way things worked and why they were not optimal is you would have to you had to manually define features like you know let's say for example let's say you want to detect names of people then you would have a feature does the is this word capitalized in english so if you're talking about identifying people in text and the text is english you would have a feature is this word capitalized and if if the word is capitalized then this kind of like hints that this is probably a person or it's more probable that it's a person so you had to work very hard to extract the features, and then your model was not very expressive. It was only the family of linear separators. So that's these are two main things that were bad 10 years ago. And the main revolution, oh, okay. Um, I see there's a question, but it's in the end. Okay. So uh, the main revolution was moving from linear models to more expressive models, specifically to neural networks. So what are neural networks? And again, I'm gonna, I don't know how much background people have in this. I know I'm not the first to talk, so probably you've heard about this already in the past, but neural networks can model nonlinear functions. They are very expressive. They, can, they are universal approximators that can approximate uh, any function to arbitrary precision on some interval. So um, um, the idea is that instead of like having this step where uh, you manually define, you get a sentence and you manually define the features of that sentence. Instead, you actually feed the neural network the actual, the actual input. So let's say, for example, you might imagine a neural network that gets its input, the words, the movie was great. First, the, movie, the word the, then the word movie, and then the word great, and so on. And it has the, the, the potential of, from these words, it actually extracts representations that will lead to the correct label. So in a nutshell, it really improves the expressivity of the model. The model is no longer linear, it's much more expressive, and therefore it is able to model very complex nonlinear relations. It can model very, very complex distributions, taking, for example, as input, a review of a movie, and then giving it as output, the sentiment, whether the movie was good or bad. Okay, so this is like a picture of a neural network where typically neural networks have an input layer and an output layer. So the output layer, for example, will be positive for uh, good movies and will be negative for bad movies. The input layer will be, for example, uh, I don't know, the words of the sentence. And then in each one of these uh, layers, there is some computation. Okay, I'm not gonna get into it. Uh, in much detail, but it, but it's written here for one possible computation. It takes each one of the inputs from the previous layer, multiplies it by some weight, adds all of them, and then uh, applies some nonlinearity. For example, if it's negative, it will turn it to zero, and if it's positive, it will just leave it as is. Okay, so you have these layers one after the other, and people have proven that if you stack these layers one after the other, you get these universal approximators. And now your model is much more expressive, and you can hope that you don't really need to design features anymore. 
you can just give the model the data in its raw form and the model will learn representations that will be useful for prediction. So if this is the input, this you can think of this as a new representation of the input, the first hidden layer. And you can think of the second layer as, an, as another hidden representation of the input. So it learns how to transform the input into representations such that in the end, it is easy to kind of like, you know, uh, predict the output properly. So these neural networks were a huge revolution. And what people find out that there is a recipe that works extremely well. And this is the recipe, let's say this is four years ago, for, uh, and this is, uh, for getting good results on, uh, for getting good, good results on arbitrary NLP tasks, okay? So let's say that you want to build a model that does something in natural language processing does something, uh, then the first thing you need to do is define your task. You're going to say, OK, I want to build a question answering model. The input will be a question and a Wikipedia page, and the output will be the answer to the question. OK, that's one. I want to build a named entity recognizer. The input will be um, um, a sentence, and the output will be all of the parts of the sentence that are people. I want to build a summarization system. The input will be a long document and the output will be a short document. This is step one. Then you collect data. You collect maybe 10,000 examples, maybe 100,000 examples. You just go to the wild and somehow find some way to collect data that represents what is it that you want to do. Okay, so you do this. You have 10,000 examples, 100,000 examples, 1 million examples, something like this. So this is the expensive uh, step. There's also what's called crowdsourcing. You can use crowdsourcing services in order to collect this data at scale. Then you design some neural network. So there are many types of neural network. There are feed forward neural networks. There are recurrent neural networks like LSTMs. There are transformers. There are continents. There are many, many types of neural networks. So you design the neural networks. And then you train your neural network. What does it mean? You set the weights of the neural network. You can see here there are these weights. These are the free parameters of the neural networks. You use some optimization algorithm to find the weights that will explain the training data. So in the space of all possible functions that your neural network can represent, and this space is very, very large, you're going to find the function that actually explains all of the, the, all of the 1 million examples that you, you collected in your training sets. And then you will see that this will generalize well. So step four, so by the way, step four is like a little bit of magic, right? It's unclear why this should work. Like, well, I guess there's two things that are unclear. First, how do I find these weights? And it turns out that there's an algorithm called backpropagation that can do that pretty reliably. So you use backpropagation, which is an optimization algorithm that given a training set and randomly initialized weights will find the weights. And then the next surprising thing, and this will actually generalize to new instances, okay? So this was the recipe, and it has led to a substantial revolution in NLP, where if, for example, in 2000, uh, you know, um, 13 or 12, people were mostly using these linear models that we talked about, these linear models where you manually define features and learn the weights of this linear model, by 2000, uh, let's say 17, everyone was using neural networks where they were feeding models uh, words in their raw form, and the neural network would learn representations uh, by itself. And it turns out that learning representations is much better than manually designing representations. We as people are limited in thinking about what are good representations that will help a model do prediction well. But designing neural networks and using this algorithm called backpropagation to optimize the weights leads to very good representations, representations that are better than what humans can do. Okay, so this was revolution number one, and this was going on both in vision and in NLP. So, you know, uh, in 2012, so these are like uh, stale numbers, but for example, People have been working on computer vision for 20 years, trying to map images to like labels, and the error rate was around 23%. So about 23% of the images would be labeled incorrectly. And then in one year, the error rate was reduced to 16%. 
uh, by using neural networks. And by 2017, it was already 6% error rate and things are even much, much better now. Uh, the same for object recognition, like finding parts of an image and so on. And also in, in NLP. So in NLP, uh, I think the main compelling use case of this was in machine translation, where in 2014, uh, people from Google uh, re proposed a neural network for machine translation. So before uh, this neural network was proposed, the pipeline for translating from uh, French uh, to English or something like that, um, it would be a very complex pipeline. You had a system that had many, many components, word alignment, phrase alignments, language models, many, many, many parts. It was very difficult to construct and things were not improving very, very quickly. And then in 2014, uh, a few researchers from Google proposed a neural network for machine translation. What does this neural network look like? It was what's called a recurrent neural network, where you can think about each of these blocks as a function. The function took as input the first word and computed something, then the second word and computed something, then the third word as computed something, and then would get as input uh, a special symbol that tells it that this is the end of the sequence. And then it would start emitting the new sentence. It would emit the first word in the new language. And then given the first word, it would emit the second word. And then given the second word, would produce the third word and so on. So each box is like a function that is a small neural network that takes as input some vectors and outputs some vectors. And not immediately, like at the beginning, it was just as good as traditional models, but it was very, very, very uh, simple, much simpler. Uh, but, and this is an example from their paper of a translation, if you speak French, uh, but uh, very quickly um, machine translation models that are based on neural networks became much, much better than uh, traditional systems. Okay, so this was revolution number one. Uh, I think I have five or 10 minutes. So now I wanna talk about uh, revolution number two, which is the focus of what the NLP world has been doing in the last maybe three or four years. And the main problem with the process that I've shown you before, the process that I've shown you uh, basically, uh, where was it? The recipe part here is that this second step is expensive. You need to collect 10,000 examples or 100,000 examples. And that's, first of all, it's pretty expensive. And the second, like we as people don't really need so many uh, examples to learn new things. Um, and the reason for, that you need to do this is because for every task, let's say you do question answering or summarization or machine translation or name that recognition, anything, you would design your neural network. This neural network has weights. Let's say it has 1 million weights. Sometimes it has 1 billion weights. Typically it has 1 billion weights. And these weights are initialized randomly. And now you need to learn the value for 1 million weights uh, just from the data. So you need a lot of data. You need maybe 100,000 examples to get good values for these weights. And this is not very uh, good. So the second revolution is what's called the self-supervised uh, revolution. What is the idea? The idea is that we need to be able to train neural networks without collecting any data at all. We should not collect data or we should collect only very little data. So what is the idea? we're going to use information that is readily available to us. For example, we can use all of the text on the web. So we will take all of the text on the web and define a task, which is a made up task and train a neural network to perform this task. And we believe, and this is our belief that will need to be verified that this neural network that was trained on a made up task on billions of examples that were collected automatically from the web without any human doing anything, that these weights are good in general. They're going to be good for machine translation. They're going to be good for summarization and for many, many things. And this turned out to be a revolutionary idea that also happens in other cases. So here's an example for a made up task that you can train on billions of examples and will Take, you will take a neural network, initialize it randomly, and then train it on this task. And in the end, you will get a very, very good neural network that provides very good representations of natural language. 
And this task is what's called language modeling. Um, it's not exactly precise what I'm saying, what I'm going to say, but in general, language modeling is giving, given the beginning of some sentence, predict the next word. So he is from France, so it makes sense he speaks, and then the model needs to fill in the next word. Or I like to eat, and then the model needs to fill in the next word. I ate am, and the model needs to fill in the next word. So you can imagine that you can generate billions of examples. You take any text from the web, you hide some part of it, and you ask your neural network to predict the missing part. So there's no problem of data. And the second thing you might kind of like think about, which is interesting, is that if you have a neural network that is extremely good at predicting the next word, given the previous words, then it must know a lot about language, and it must know a lot about the world. So um, he is from France, so it makes sense he speaks something. If the neural network knows that the proper word here is French, this means that somewhere in the weights, in the memory of the neural network, it learned that in France there is a language, and that language is French. Okay, and if it feels feels I like to eat with a food, then it learned first of all that some things are edible, some things are not, and which ones are edible and which ones are not. And also, it knows that this is a noun, right? You can say I like to eat. You know, maybe it's good to say I like to eat apples. Maybe it's not as good, but okay to say I like to eat paper. Uh, but it's really worse to say I like to eat how, right? Like this is not grammatical and so on. So by doing this made up task of predicting the next word, you can train the neural network on billions of examples and get a neural network that has very, very good weights. And if you do that and then train it a little more on your end task, you get very good uh, models. So uh, this is one, one made up task. Here's another made up task that people like, which is called mass language modeling. So you get a sentence, the man went to the mask to buy a mask of milk. So you get, give them a, a neural network a sentence and you hide some of the words and you ask it to predict the missing words. So it's very similar to language modeling, but instead of being left to right, it just does it in random places. This is a very useful task. And the last is a sentence prediction, or maybe there's more. Uh, so next sentence prediction. So here's another made up task. You can take uh, a text, delete the second half of the text, and then give the neural network the first half and the second half, or the first half and just some random text from somewhere else. And you ask the neural network, please tell me, are these two parts related to one another or are they not? And if this neural network is able to do this, then it knows something about text coherence. It knows something about which words kind of like typically occur with other words. So the general recipe, as you can see, is you take text from the world, you kind of like mess around with it, and you ask the neural network to reconstruct the original text. And this is also true here, where you can kind of like train a model to generate things. Let's not get into it just because of lack of time. But the, like the fundamental idea is that neural networks, as they become bigger, they are better. And as they become bigger, they need a lot of training data. So how do you get this training data? You get data automatically from the world, images, videos, text, whatever you want. And then you come up with these made up tasks that when you train the neural network to perform them, then this network is now really ready to perform language tasks or vision tasks and so on. So here are some examples for some standard benchmarks. I assume none of you, this doesn't mean a lot to people, but you know, before pre this is the first pre-trained model that obtained an accuracy of 70% on a very standard task. And as pre-training progressed in the last three years, uh, now um, uh, performance is at 90%. And this is better than what humans do. Here's another example uh, in textual inference uh, where you give a neural network two sentences and ask it whether the first sentence entails the second sentence. So given a soccer game with multiple males playing, this entails some men are playing sport, but a man inspects the uniform of a figure does not entail the man is sleeping. So in 2015, before pre-training, uh, models were able to get about 80% of these examples correctly. And 2017, it's almost 90% and it's increasing now. 
uh, the same in question answering, given a paragraph and a question about that paragraph in 2016, systems were able to answer about 54% correctly, and now it's above human accuracy, around 90%. And there are many, many famous uh, uh, you know, articles and papers showing that in tasks like machine translation on some pairs of languages, now models are as good as humans. Okay, so that's basically all I wanted to talk about. Um, um, so, you know, 10 years ago, NLP was done mostly by fitting linear models to handcrafted features. And then two revolutions have happened. The first is the use of neural networks, where you train very expressive learning machines. And the second is using self-supervision to really train large neural networks to get good representations of language. And this has led to the point where NLP has become a very mature field technologically. And there's a lot of applications nowadays and things are working a lot better than in the past. Uh, yeah, so that was a, a short story about NLP in the last year, years, years ago. Uh, and thank you and thanks for inviting me. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Professor, for that extremely interesting and in-depth talk. I'm sure our students have thoroughly enjoyed themselves. They've sent in a few questions for you. I will pose them to you one by one. Okay. So we have one question from Shara. What if it was the movie was great, not capital great, or not at all? The movie was great. How will it differentiate between the two nots? Yeah, so... Uh, yeah. Okay, so I think I get it. So you're right that when I presented the linear model, I don't know if I should share my screen and go back to that. I can share my screen. Let's see. Do you see my screen or not? Yes, so we can see your screen yeah. the presentation. Yeah, I like the presentation. Okay. I think now you see it. So I think the reason for this question is because I said that uh, in the kind of na like naive uh, feature representation for the movie was great. I said that you just count which words uh, occur and which words do not occur, right? So if it was the movie was not great, what we, we will get is like, uh, the account of one for great and account of one for not great, but this doesn't really make sense. Like not great should be like negating. So right, like if if the weight for great is like I don't know three, maybe for not great it should be like minus three or something like that. And this kind of points to the deficiency of this representation. So this is a naive representation that works quite well, better than you would expect, but it doesn't model some of the fundamental properties of language, and that is the fact that language is not just a bag of words. The order actually matters and words kind of like apply operations on other words. So in a bag of word representation, it's impossible to uh, model negation, right? Like let's say you had the movie was great, the movie was not great, the movie was not not great. These things, things mean different things and you cannot expect to be able to capture these nuances just by counting words and giving a real weight, like a number a number for every weight, and this is just not captured. Uh, unlike that, neural networks uh, can model these nonlinear functions and they can look at the interaction between words and actually model negation. So it's true that it's not like anything that has to do about the order of words and cannot be expressed just by counting plus some linear function is beyond the expressivity of these linear models, which is the point. Thank you, Professor. Another question from Ronak. According to you, what are the everyday uses of NLP? What are its main applications? Uh, well, I guess like my, my uh, intuition is as good as yours. Uh, I mean, I'd be happy to hear if people have uh, interesting um, uh, applications of NLP, but it's, it's very, very wide. I could like, kind of like try to think about it. So, of course, there's, you know, just access to information. So, right, I want to ask arbitrary questions to a search engine and get 
good answers. Right now, I can do it well in English. I cannot do it in all languages of the world well. Uh, I can ask simple questions, but maybe not complex one. If I ask, you know, what are the, in the US, what are the states whose capital is also the largest by area? And this is beyond the reach. Uh, so a, a huge application is information access, and we can do some things, but not everything. Um, translation is a huge application, of course. It's a very uh, big um, uh, a field. Nowadays, there's a lot of work on like applications that are based on generation, right? So now we're kind of at a point where neural networks can generate text that is very, very coherent. So there are more and more applications around text generation. Uh, so, you know, maybe not like in very sensitive uh, use cases. So the problem with neural networks is they're not robust. They sometimes behave in non-predictable ways. So uh, it's kind of like risky to use them uh, in cases where a mistake is very, very expensive. If you can imagine many education scenarios, let's say I want to learn a, a foreign language like Hindi, maybe I can like talk to a bot, right? Like, and it can generate text, understand what I say and converse with me. Um, um, so this is another very important application. I guess it's all in your imagination, anything that has to do with text, but the main properties are, you know, there's a lot of text in the world and it's hard to access, like finding the information that you're interested in, is, it's hard. And, and I think there's a lot of like in creative stuff. So again, because text generation is so good, there's more and more interest in like, you know, creative generation of stories and books between humans and computers. Really like, I don't know, uh, there's so much that can be done with language. I just said a few that pop into my head, but I'm sure we'll see many interesting applications of NLP uh, in the near future. Thank you, Professor. Naman Keetan asked why we need two hidden layers. Processing can be done by just one hidden layer also. Right, it's true so that a one hidden layer can be a universal approximator, but uh, you need many, many hidden units, right? So the number of units, kind of, of units kind of like grows very, very fast and depth can kind of like uh, reduce this. So you can trade off uh, um, the width of the hidden layer with deeper neural networks and gain expressivity. There's a lot of theory on that. You can read from Joshua Bengio back in the day, very classical, but also empirically we find uh, in many cases that deeper models are better, uh, empirically get better performance. Um, uh, so both, you know, both theoretically, there's like efficiency reasons and both empirically that deep networks work better in practice. So now people train net networks with, with Envision 150 layers, in natural language processing 24, 48 layers, and they find that adding depth is often beneficial more than adding width, the number of units in the hidden layer. Thanks, Professor. An anonymous attendee asked, could you explain how a perceptron can be used to classify letters of different fonts? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Like this is like, how would I, so perceptron, is like a linear model. There's perceptron, there's multi-layer perceptron. So I'm not sure if the question is about the linear model, the like the classical Rosenblatt 1954 perceptron that was proposed like uh, 65 years ago, uh, which is just a linear model. Or is this about what's called multi-layer perceptrons, which is a different name for feed-forward neural networks. So that's one thing I'm not sure about this question. Uh, and the second is, how can it be used to classify letters of different fonts? Well, I guess if you want to cast that as a supervised, so let's imagine that he's talking about multi-layer perceptrons, not about the difference between linear and non-linear. Well, what you can do is you can, you can um, design a neural network where like I, I imagine that uh, I'm getting an image of some character. Again, this is vision, this is not my field, but anyway. Um, uh, you get an image of some character and you need to output the correct font, right? Like this is the task basically. And maybe there's lighting issues, maybe it's skewed, skewed, I don't know. Let's say that there's some noise also, so it's hard. Um, then you get the image. What is an image? It's like a bunch of pixels, right? Maybe it's 28 pixels by 28 pixels. So you have 784 values and every pixel um, 
has some uh, you know gray level whether it's uh, more white or more gray so it's a number between zero and 255 that kind of like represents how black or white it is so you get an array like a vector the length is 784 and in each position you have a number between zero and 255 and that is the raw input it is a representation of the image that was given to you now so the input layer in the neural network has 784 units you add like one hidden layer two hidden layers let's not argue about this details and then at the end you have an output layer where the possible outputs are all the fonts that you're considering david ariel calibri i don't know sans comic whatever uh, so you get a probability distribution over all possible fonts and you output the one with the highest probability so you collect a training data you collect like 10,000 examples of images and the font uh, and then you uh, run them through the neural network and what's called minimize the loss or optimize find the weights of the neural network that will explain why this image is David and that image is uh, some other font and then you run it at test time so I'm not sure this was the question but like this is an example for something that can be solved with neural networks and in this case the represent the input representation will be uh, 784 values between 0 and 255 and the output will be a probability distribution over uh, I don't know 10 different fonts so it will be a vector of size 10 where each entry has some number between 0 and 1 and they sum to 1. I hope this I hope this answers the question. I hope the same that the question referred to what you have drawn clarity on, Professor. We move to another question from an anonymous attendee. Does the regularization technique really prevent the neural network from overfitting? Right. So I didn't talk about this, so maybe I'll just explain a little bit for uh, everyone. So uh, what happens is that oftentimes you have neural networks that are very large. They have like a billion weights and the training data is small. So let's say there's 1,000 examples, so many, many more parameters than weights. Um, and this can lead to a phenomenon called overfitting. What is overfitting is the case where you perfectly explain your training set. So for the 1,000 examples that you were given as a training set, you predict them perfectly. They have zero loss, what's called. You don't, you're very happy. But then when you try to uh, apply them on a new uh, example that you have never seen before, performance is really bad. And this is because the model is expressive enough such that it can kind of like memorize the input without really generalizing at all, without really learning real features that are useful in general. It just kind of like memorize the inputs. So to do that, there's what's called regularization. Regularization are techniques that do not allow the neural network to learn any weights, but they constrain them in some way. Here's one very typical constraint. You want the values, the weights to be small, to be very, very small. Like if, uh, if there's a weight where the weight is like 1 million, this is bad. So if you restrict your neural network to fit the training data and also uh, to have a low norm, basically the, the, the numbers of each one of the weights to be low, then this regularizes the neural network. It doesn't allow it to memorize the training data and then it learns representation that actually generalize. So yeah, regularization is very important for avoiding overfitting. It is true that uh, you know, pre-trained language models, the fact that you can pre-train on billions of made up examples uh, reduces the, the, the need for regularization a little bit. Uh, but typically regularization is like, you can always apply more and more regularization and then it will overfit less and less. It's, Sometimes it's okay to overfit a little bit. So the best performance at test time is not necessarily without any overfitting, but you don't want too aggressive overfitting for sure. So I guess the yes, no answer is yes. Thanks, Professor. There's one more question asking there are major problems in training deep new neural networks. Could you explain some of the gradient problems? Um, there are major problems in training neural networks. Can I explain some of the gradient problems? 
This is a very, very wide question. So again, it's hard to say exactly what is meant. In general, the way people train neural networks is through a method called backpropagation uh, that kind of like takes the loss and computes the gradient of the loss with respect to all of the weights. Uh, now, there are, it's, it's true that there are optimization issues and there's a lot of mechanisms for, avoid, for, for uh, um, um, solving optimization issues. Again, I'm not an optimization person, but again, as I said, optimization is the problem of finding the weights that explain the training set. So I, I can just talk about two very uh, common um, things in optimization that people do. One is what's called the vanishing gradient problem. So one famous problem in, uh, in, in optimizing neural network is the vanishing gradient problem. What does that mean? It means that let's say, for example, in natural language, let's say he's from France, so it makes sense that he spoke, speaks French. The distance between the word French and the word France is large. It's like 10 words or something. And you, what you need to do is you need to when you predict, let's say that the model predicts he's from France, so therefore it is not surprising that his native language is, let's say it predicts Spanish, right? So there is a loss there. The model kind of like uh, gets penalized for predicting a bad thing. But what, what does this loss need to do? This loss needs to kind of like change the weights of the representation of France such that next time, hopefully it will predict French. So, and this is what's called far away. So the fact that the loss happens 20 steps after the place where the weights need to change in order for this loss to go down in a sense, uh, this leads to optimization problems. The fact that the gradient needs to travel for 20 steps. So there's this problem called vanishing gradient, for example. And then there's like a very typical solution. It's called like residual connections. So people kind of like use um, some functional form that I don't think we have time to get into that kind of like alleviates uh, vanishing gradients problems. Uh, there's, you know, um, um, uh, on the other hand, there's what's called exploding gradients where gradients suddenly become very large and then uh, optimization fails. So there's a technique called gradient clipping for handling that. And then there's a lot of stuff about like the actual magnitude of values uh, and making sure like there's what's called batch. And I didn't say what a batch is. So how do you normalize the numbers that are output by a neural network so that they are kind of like behave nicely around zero with not too crazy standard deviation. So there's what's called normalization techniques. There are layers that neural network layers that kind of like normalize the values to be nice in some sense. So there's batch norm and there's like layer norm and there's many types of normalization techniques, but it's true, like optimization is a huge field, a difficult field, you know, like uh, training neural networks, neural networks are non -con very complex functions, non-convex, and there are theoretical questions on why this works at all. Empirically, it works very well. In theory, it's not clear why this works, why it finds good, good, good uh, uh, solutions, even though the space, the search space is so large, uh, and there's a lot of work on that. And in some cases, there are issues and people use many techniques like residual networks and batch norm. So I hope this answers the question. But like in general, optimization is a huge field that is applied on neural networks. And they have a very large toolbox that is you know, complex and varied and we cannot cover it right now. Thank you, Professor. I'm sure that was fascinating and all the questions and their answers were easily understandable by the students. I'm sure they have also gained knowledge, a lot of learning they're taking back with them. Thank you all for your questions. If you have more questions, you can send it in quickly via the Q&A box. And just to, in the meanwhile, just to answer queries regarding recording, the recording will be uploaded on our YouTube page. So you can check that out just to have, need to find our Ananda Aspen Center on YouTube. With that, I would like to say thank you so much, Professor, for joining us today and for such an informative presentation and insightful on an extremely interesting topic that is prevailing in the market right now. Okay, thank you for the invite, it was fun. Thank you so much, Professor. Bye.